do nam poštovani gledalci, hvala što pratite i gledate kanal Balkana Projetix. Eto, danas imam veliku čast da ugostim čoveka, eto, koji je mene pre svega nadahnuo da počnem s ovim projektom, apologetikom i svojim stvarima, dr. Vila Imelina Krega, čoveka sa ogromnim brojem doktorata, čoveka koji, eto, šta da kažem, koji je najviše upravo u ovom, u apologetici, u poznavanju Boga, hrišćanstva, koji najviše propagira te ideje, eto, velika mi je čast da ga imam, eto, danas sa mnom u intervju. Dr. Craig, da, da, ovo intervju će najme biti, bit će subtitle na engleskom, tako da će svi eto moći da ga pogledaju i prati. Dr. Craig, thank you for being part of this intervju. Well, I'm delighted to do it. I want to be of encouragement to folks in the Balkans, and particularly in Serbia, and also a challenge to non-believers as well. Uh, Dr. Craig, uh, we have a big problem. People always say, uh, I don't believe in God because there is so much evil in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. In Balkans we have so much wars, so much, uh, so much problems, uh, NATO bombarding, 1990s, and uh, we say there is no God because there is evil. Is that, um, yeah. is that some connections with God and evil? And how can God <laughs> exist because of the existence of evil? Mm-hmm. I think here it's really important that we make a distinction between the intellectual problem of evil and the emotional problem of evil. There's absolutely no doubt that emotionally speaking, evil poses a tremendous obstacle to believe in God. It's hard to believe in God in the face of such terrible and innocent suffering. But as a philosopher, I have to say honestly that it is very difficult to mount an intellectually sound argument against the existence of God based upon the evil in the world. The atheist would have to prove that the evil in the world is either impossible with respect to God's existence or highly improbable with respect to God's existence. And both of those place a burden of proof on the atheists that has proven uh, too heavy for any of them to bear. Uh, Logically, uh, it is widely acknowledged among philosophers today that there's no logical contradiction between the existence of God and the existence of evil and suffering in the world. It's logically possible that they could coexist. And in terms of the probability argument, the atheist would have to show that it is highly improbable that God could have morally sufficient reasons for allowing the evil and suffering in the world. Now, how could the atheist possibly prove that? How could he possibly prove that God, if he exists, probably doesn't have morally sufficient reasons for allowing the evil and suffering in the world. As a Christian, I believe that God's overriding purpose for human history is to bring as many people as possible freely into an eternal love relationship with himself. And that demands human freedom on the part of the people that he creates. And I think honestly that it is not at all improbable that only in a world suffused with natural and moral evil would the optimal number of people come freely to embrace God and his salvation and come into a personal relationship with God forever. And so the atheist would have to show that there is some other possible world that God could have created um, which would involve just as much um, salvation and people coming into eternal relationship with God as the actual world, but with less evil and suffering. And there's no way that he could prove such a thing. It's pure speculation. So intellectually speaking, um, the evil and suffering in the world do not constitute a very good argument against the existence of God. It relies upon probability judgments that are just way beyond our capacity to competently make. 
Uh, why doesn't God simply re uh, reveal himself to people so that everyone could see him and believe him? Well, I think that God has revealed himself to everyone. Uh, the Bible says that God has revealed himself to all mankind in nature and in conscience. In the created order around us, we see the handiwork of an eternal, powerful, intelligent creator of the universe. And in our moral experience, we apprehend the moral demands of God's moral law so that we understand our culpability before him for our own moral wrongdoing. Now, what the objector might say here, and I think this would be a, a legitimate response, is to say, well, but surely God could have made his existence even more obvious to everyone. Uh, he could have... Say that. Yes. That, that's what I want to say, what, what God does yeah. reveal to me personally. Yeah, oh, you, you, the, the atheist might say, why doesn't God uh, write his name in the stars or put a neon cross in the sky that says Jesus saves? Um, but I think what the objector here fails to understand is that God's desire and purpose for humanity is not simply getting people to believe that he exists. God could certainly have made his existence much more obvious than he has, and that might get people to believe that he exists. But God's overriding purpose is not just to add uh, or to get people to add one more item to their ontological inventory of things. Rather, his purpose is to draw people into a saving personal love relationship with himself. And it's possible that in any world in which God made his existence even more obvious, that no people would have come to freely know and love him than those that do in the actual world. God knows how much evidence to apportion to each person he creates to give that person sufficient rational grounds for believing in his existence. Uh, and if giving greater evidence would make a, a difference, then I'm sure God would have done it. Um, but uh, given his overriding purpose to bring people into a saving love relationship with himself, uh, he's under no obligation whatsoever to give more evidence of his existence if he knew that in fact it wouldn't do any good with respect to achieving that purpose. Uh, why did God order Abraham to sacrifice his son a Isaac? How could God order such um, such such evil thing for us? This is really a strange story, isn't it, in the book of Genesis? As to why God did it, I think he was testing Abraham. He wanted to test Abraham's complete devotion to God and his trust in God's promise to provide Abraham an heir uh, and descendants, as many as the stars in the sky. Now, how could God do such a thing? I think that's the more difficult yes, and yes. interesting philosophical question. And here I would defend what's called a divine command theory of ethics. And according to a divine command theory of ethics, our moral duties are constituted by God's commands. Moral obligations arise as a result of imperatives that are issued by a competent authority. And God, as the ultimate good, is the competent authority to issue to us moral commands, which then become our moral obligations. And so because of that, um, Abraham was morally obligated to do what God commanded him to do, uh, even though God was so merciful that he did not demand that Abraham carry it through, but uh, stopped him before he could uh, kill Isaac. Uh, there, are many no uh, there are many nominal Christians. Uh, 
they just believe in God, yet do not uh, differ from non-believers in the way of life. How do you solve that problem since they believe they are true Christians? We have that. Yeah. I was such a person at one time as a teenager. I began to attend church looking for answers and was nominally Christian, but I didn't really know God. For me, God was distant and removed and unreal. Uh, and it was then that I met a girl in my high school German class who was a radiant Christian and who shared the love of God with me. And I began at that time to read the New Testament. And what I discovered there was that my problem was that my own personal wrongdoing, my moral um, failure, what the Bible calls sin, had separated me from God, relationally speaking, that my relationship with God that I was created to have had been ruptured by my moral wrongdoing, and that therefore I needed God's forgiveness and moral cleansing. And it was no wonder that God seemed so unreal and distant from me at that time, because I was spiritually alienated from God by my own moral evil. Um, but the message of the New Testament was, or is, that God has sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die to pay the penalty for sin that I deserved. Uh, he bore the death penalty of sin that was my just desert. And this then gives God uh, the opportunity to forgive my sin on the basis of Christ's atoning death, and so, by accepting God's forgiveness, my relationship with God can be restored um, and my sin forgiven, and I can be cleansed of my moral wrongdoing. Uh, and that is the difference between someone who is merely a nominal Christian and someone who is a genuine um, Christian who has experienced this inner spiritual transformation uh, by receiving Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, how to spread the gospel among people who do not know anything about God? Or perhaps they believe in God or some form of divinity, they can have some mm -hmm. religious tradition yet uh, are not Christians yet. I can say people school. I think that one of the best things we can do is to um, distribute the New Testament as widely as possible. I already described how it made such a difference in my life reading the New Testament for the first time. Um, and so I think it is very powerful if we can get the New Testament into the hands of unbelievers and get them to read it. And I think this is particularly true for Muslims. Um, Muslims are generally not familiar firsthand with the New Testament. They've never read it. And I believe that if they would read it, they would find the person of Jesus of Nazareth tremendously attractive and compelling, uh, and that this would be a means by which they might come to saving faith in Christ. Uh, the biggest question of all times is why you think that go uh, that God exists. Uh, you you oh. you you uh, well, so much time you have speak about that thing, but I think we need to have uh, uh, okay. back uh, think about that. Well, I do agree with you that this is the most fundamental question. It is the watershed issue between atheism and theism. And I believe that there are a number of good arguments for the existence of God, which I've defended in my published work and then in debates on university campuses in both North America and in Europe. Let me just list for you some of these arguments. One, God is the best explanation why anything at all exists rather than nothing. Two, God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe at a point in the finite past. Three, God is the best explanation for the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. 
Four, God is the best explanation for the uncanny applicability of mathematics to the physical world. Five, God is the best explanation for the objectivity of moral values and duties in the world. And six, God is the best explanation for um, the very possibility of God's existence. The very possibility of God's existence, I believe, implies that God exists. And finally, I would cap it off with number seven by saying that uh, we can know personally that God exists by having a personal experience of God, such as I described in my own life. Now, each of those seven points needs to be unfolded, uh, the premises laid out, and then the arguments and evidence in favor of the premises uh, displayed. And I've tried to do that in detail in my published work, but I think this gives you at least an overview of a powerful cumulative case that can be made for the existence of a personal creator and designer of the universe who is the paradigm of absolute moral goodness. Uh, Dr. Dr. Craig, why do you think that God is the best explanation for moral, moral values and duties? Is that the theory mm -hmm. of evolution, uh, maybe? Oh, I don't think there's any incompatibility between the theory of evolution and the objectivity of moral values. Because if God exists, God is himself the absolute standard of right and wrong. God is the supreme good. And as I said earlier, his commands constitute our moral duties. So if God exists, there are objective moral values and duties. And if God has chosen to create human beings through a process of evolutionary development, that's his prerogative. There's nothing about that that would subvert the reality of objective moral values and duties. Rather, what I think subverts the objectivity of moral values and duties is naturalism or atheism, the view that there is no God. If there is no God, then there doesn't seem to be any absolute standard for good and evil, right and wrong. In that case, all we're left with is the blind evolutionary process and the herd morality evolved by Homo sapiens on this planet is just an aid to our survival and flourishing, but doesn't seem to have any sort of objective or binding uh, value to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, many people in Balkans think they are good uh, they when they perform they they don't kill every, anyone they did not steal anything they they form a family they help other people they go to church perform rituals and they will uh, will they will uh, will they be saved because of that because they are just normal oh. people oh i'm sure that there are many people that are good and decent people but the fact is that we're nevertheless all sinners. Every one of us has failed to live up to our moral duties. Uh, every one of us has succumbed to anger or selfishness or hatred or uh, lust or materialism or, or whatever. There's no perfect person. And so it's impossible to earn your way to heaven. The only way to go to heaven is to simply gratefully receive God's unmerited grace and forgiveness for our sins, uh, and that is made available through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, if Christianity is true, then why did it cause so much evil and that, like medieval crusaders and uh, inquisition yeah. and things like that? I think that the reason is because Christianity has a very serious doctrine of sin. Uh, Christianity does not paint a cheery, optimistic picture of human beings. Rather, we see human beings as fallen creatures who are infected with evil and therefore uh, inclined toward selfishness and sin. 
And so the Christian is not at all surprised at all of the horrible evil that people have perpetrated in the world, even in the name of Christianity itself. Um, the perversity of human beings is such that they can take even the best and the finest things that human beings have achieved and twist them to their own selfish ends and evil purposes. Uh, it's been rightly said that wherever there's honey, there will also be flies. And we shouldn't think that because of the flies, the honey is any less sweet. So uh, I think that the uh, Christian gospel is true, but part of the Christian gospel is a very serious doctrine of sin that has no illusions about the goodness or perfectibility of human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, you listed arguments for God, but what is the best proof of, for existence of God in your opinion? If I have, if I have the chance for argu one, one argument to say to uh -huh. atheists, what will you say? Well, my favorite argument is the second one I mentioned, the argument from the beginning of the universe. And it goes like this. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. Something that comes into being just can't pop into existence from nothing. So anything that begins to exist must have a cause. But the universe began to exist. And here I think there are powerful philosophical arguments against the infinity of the past, as well as remarkable scientific evidence Uh, disclosed only during the 20th century that shows that the universe had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. And on the basis of those two premises, then, you can conclude that therefore the universe has a cause. And then you analyze what it means to be a cause of the universe, a cause of space and time, matter and energy, And you come to the conclusion that there must exist a first, uncaused, beginningless, changeless, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, personal creator of the universe of enormous power. Um, and that, I think, is the core concept of what we mean by God. Uh, many people in Balkans think the gospel is just fairy tale. What you s mm. I, I speak to much people and they say, ah, it's fairy tale. Yeah, I, I think that's based upon ignorance. Uh, I did my doctoral work in theology at the University of Munich in Germany, and I wrote on the historical credibility of the resurrection of Jesus. And I think what people who dismiss the Gospels as fairy tales don't understand is that the Gospels are valued by historians as highly credible sources for the life of Jesus of Nazareth. We have more historical information about this man, Jesus of Nazareth, than we do for most major figures of antiquity. We have no fewer than four biographies of this man, Jesus of Nazareth. And when historical scholars explore the Gospels using the ordinary standards of historiography, they find them to be very credible sources for the life of this man. And in particular, what I discovered is that the wide majority of historical Jesus scholars, whether conservative or liberal or, or non-Christian, Jewish, um, is that the, there is widespread agreement on the fundamental facts undergirding the inference that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and these would be the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb by a group of his women disciples on the Sunday morning following his crucifixion. Secondly, the appearances of Jesus alive after his death to various individuals and groups of people. And finally, number three, the uh, transformation in the earliest disciples, uh, despite every predisposition to the contrary, whereby they came suddenly and sincerely to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Now, those are the facts 
Um, and so the only question really is how do you best explain them? And I'm persuaded that the best explanation is the one that the original disciples gave, namely that God raised him from the dead. And this is said simply on the basis of treating these New Testament documents not as inspired books, but as ordinary historical records written in the Greek language and handed down to us out of the first century. Uh, some Muslims will say, why, why, uh, why believing in the Bible when we have a Quran? Quran? Yeah. This is a very, very interesting comparison. The New Testament was written within the first generation after the events that it records, uh, while eyewitnesses were still alive. By contrast, the Quran was written 600 years after Jesus by a man living in Saudi Arabia who had no firsthand contact even with a New Testament. And what you discover is that the Quran incorporates into its pages demonstrably legendary stories about Jesus that were circulating in the ancient Near East during those several centuries after Christ. And so no historical scholar, none, treats the Quran as a primary source for historical information about Jesus of Nazareth. It is secondary and derivative and filled with legendary elements. In fact, it's an embarrassment for Muslims that the one indisputable fact about Jesus of Nazareth is denied by the Quran, and that is that Jesus of Nazareth died by Roman crucifixion. Uh, and the Quran says they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him, but it only appeared to them that it was so. And so the one indisputable fact about Jesus is denied by the Quran, uh, which is just really an enormous embarrassment for Islam. Uh, one of very interesting question is, what is God's relationship to time? Is he, in, is he out of time? Mm. Is he in time? What, what is he in relationship to time? Well, now we get into very speculative philosophy, and here there is no orthodox Christian view on this question. This is a question on which the Bible is ambiguous. The Bible affirms that God is eternal in the sense that he never came into being and he will never go out of being. God is permanent. But the Bible doesn't tell us whether God exists throughout infinite time or whether he simply transcends time altogether and exists timelessly. And uh, philosophers have debated this for centuries. And I will simply report to you that my studied opinion on this question is a kind of hybrid view. I think that God is timeless without creation, but in time since the moment of creation. And I've defended this view in my book, Time and Eternity. Uh, in Bible, I think, uh, in some place, uh, says that God uh, just uh, just repent about Saul and he's not happy about mm -hmm. King. How can God uh, just if he uh, is he uh, if he is out of time? How can he say things like that? Yeah, uh, if God is omniscient, yes, yes, then yes. He knows everything, past, present, and future. And the Bible is very clear that God foreknows the future. There's an actual Greek word used in the New Testament, prognosis, which means foreknowledge, and the verbal form, prognosko, to foreknow. So the Bible teaches that God foreknows the future. And therefore, I take it that in these uh, passages where it says that God repented, that he had made man, he was sorry he had made man, and so forth, that these are what uh, biblical scholars call anthropomorphisms, 
or anthropopathisms. They're descriptions of God using human metaphors and images that are not to be taken literally. The Bible is not a philosophy book. Uh, It's not even a systematic theology book. It's a book of stories, and it exhibits all of the color and the verve of an ancient Near Eastern storyteller. And so these passages that speak of God's uh, repenting of something that he was going to do or, or had done, I think are simply part of the storyteller's art and should not be taken philosophically. Uh, can God create a rock uh, so heavy <laughs> that he can lift? There's, this, this question is so much been asked. Uh, question yeah. from evil and that, that is the most. Yeah, that's a very old question. And I think that most Christian philosophers would say that what is envisioned there is a logical impossibility. Uh, and that omnipotence does not mean the ability to do the logically impossible. So God could not create a round square, for example, and that's no infringement upon his omnipotence because those are just contradictory combinations of words. They're not really anything at all. There is no such thing as a rock too heavy for God to lift. So um, omnipotence does not apply, imply the ability to do the logically impossible. Uh, what about mythologies of the ancient people? There are many ancient mythics and legends that tell the story yeah. similar to Bible. How do you explain yes. that? Well, I have made a study of this over the last two years in my book, In Quest of the Historical Adam. And what you discover is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis uh, resemble ancient Mesopotamian mythology in two respects. One would be in the grand themes that are treated in these myths, things like the origin of the universe, the creation of humanity, the great flood that nearly destroyed the human race. Um, And then the second element would be what uh, scholars call etiology. And etiology is the attempt to ground realities that are present to the author in events in the prehistoric past. And Genesis 1 to 11 is permeated by these etiological motifs. Uh, Just to give one example, the Jewish practice of the Sabbath is grounded in the creation account where God rests on the seventh day, and so in the same way Jews are commanded to rest on the Sabbath day. Now what this suggests to me is that these chapters are not to be understood literalistically as a literal history. I think they do concern historical people and events that really happened, but they are clothed in the garb of myth and metaphor. And that therefore what we should think of Genesis 1 to 11 in terms of is a literary genre called mytho-history. It's a kind of blend of mythology and history whereby you have historical events, but they are described in the figurative language of myth. Uh, people just want to know how to know God. Some say, I know God, I speak to him. How to know God? How to be like David, like Solomon in his time? Yeah. How to know God? I would answer that by saying that all of us are sinful people and that therefore we find ourselves in a condition of spiritual death and alienation from God. And that when we give our lives to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, when we accept his pardon for our sins and make him the master of our lives, 
we are literally born again spiritually. God's Spirit regenerates us so that where before there was spiritual death and darkness, now there is spiritual life and light. It's as though you had a burned out spiritual light bulb inside you, and God replaces that bulb with a new bulb and the light comes on. Uh, and that is the knowledge of God. We come to know God through this event of being born anew or regenerated spiritually by God's Spirit when we give our lives uh, to Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Uh, one one theme in Bible is generally much discussed in my region. Um, when you uh, when he, when one hits you in the one um, in one place uh, turn another um, another Jesus said uh, sometimes it's just people that do, uh, yeah, this is the best way to to for this question uh, it's okay for Christians to turn wars to war like David to be just like that sort of people I want to say. Yes. Again, I think this is a question on which Christians have a diversity of viewpoints. Uh, and so you are open, you are free to follow your conscience where it leads you in this respect. I will note a couple of things. There's a very interesting story uh, where Roman soldiers come to John the Baptist And they ask John, what should we do? And John does not tell them to withdraw or desert from the Roman army, uh, to get out of military service. Instead, what John says to them is, be content with your wages and do not defraud any man. In other words, to be good and honorable soldiers. And that gives me to suggest that it is possible to be a Christian soldier in the military serving one's um, country. Uh, Paul in Romans 13 says that when the Roman emperor uh, exerts military force, he is the agent of God for bringing justice upon wrongdoers. Um, and that, again, suggests that a Christian who is engaged in military service is serving the Lord and is an instrument of God's justice. Uh, some atheists we say, uh, will say that it's just illogical to, to think that God exists because we don't need him. We, we talk about arguments for God, but what will you say about that people who say these things? I'm not sure I understand what the okay, objection okay, is. Okay. Uh, some people just think that it's illogical to, to, to believe in God, some being that is not material. What you say then? I would need to see some sort of argument on their part. If they don't have an argument, then this is just their opinion, and it's no better than the next man's. Uh, the seven arguments that I outlined for you a few moments ago, give reason to believe that there is a personal creator of the universe who transcends space and time and is therefore an immaterial agent. And I would say that this is perfectly plausible um, because we know ourselves, I believe, as immaterial agents. I'm not identical with my body. If you are a physicalist, and believe there is no soul or mind or self distinct from the body, then you have to believe that there is no identity of the self over time, that there is no mental causation, that everything is determined and there is no free will, and that therefore moral praise and blame is impossible. All of those are very radical uh, consequences of physicalism. Uh, and so I think that we are familiar with ourselves as immaterial agents who are embodied, and God would be an unembodied immaterial agent. 
Uh, could you explain the relationship between relationship between God, the Father, the Christ, and the Son of God? Uh, if Christ is God, how could He pray to God and some things like that? Oh, well, we need to understand that in the Christian view, Jesus of Nazareth had two natures. He had a divine nature, and he also had a human nature. So there was one person, but with two natures. And when Jesus prayed to God the Father and relied upon God the Father for strength and guidance, this was Christ praying to the Father in his human nature, uh, not in his divine nature. So once we understand that, you can make that distinction between what Jesus did in his human nature and what he did in his divine nature. Uh, there are Christians who claim that the Holy Spirit is not God, but the Spirit of the Father or Spirit of the Christ, not a, sp a special being yeah. or a separate being. They claim uh, there are only Father and Son. Have you heard of that teaching and what do you think yeah. about that? Well, I'm not persuaded that that is the teaching of the New Testament. If you look at the New Testament, you will find Uh, passages in which the Holy Spirit is described as God. For example, for example, in the book of Acts, in the story of Annas and Sapphira, Peter says to them, you have, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the land? You have not lied to men, but to God. So there, Peter equates the Holy Spirit with God. Moreover, we find in the teachings of Jesus that the Holy Spirit is differentiated from both Jesus and from God the Father. He is a third person. And so I think that the testimony of the New Testament is that the Holy Spirit both is God and is a distinct person from the Father and the Son, uh, and therefore is one member of the Trinity. And I think it would be of interest to Christians in the Balkans to know that the uh, Greek Orthodox um, Cappadocian Church Fathers, like Gregory Nazianzus, Basil, and Gregory of Nyssa, were strong proponents of the deity and personhood of the Holy Spirit, so that this is a very strong tradition in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Poštovani gledalci, hvala što ste pratili gledali intervju, a eto mi se vidimo u nekom narednom. Uh, Dr. Craig, thank you again for being the part of the intervju. It's just my honest, I'm sorry for bad English. Oh, not at all. Uh, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today. May God bless all of the listeners there in the Balkans.